Okay, so hi. So welcome to the first ever World of Darkness video game panel. I'm Piotr. I'm working for Walkabout Games. We have the publisher of Arthur's Different Tales, uh, where we've Apocalypse Hot of the Forest. Can you also, guys, introduce yourself? Okay, so my name is Artur Ganszyniec, and I'm a designer at Different Tales, and we are working on a game called Werewolf the Apocalypse, Heart of the Forest. Eric? Yeah, uh, so my name is Eric Odeldal. I'm the creative director and writer at Swedish game, uh, VR game dev, uh, Fast Travel Games. Um, and my name is uh, Krzysztof Zjumba. I'm a designer and writer at Draw Distance. We have published, uh, um, developed and published Coteries of New York last year, and we are currently working on Shadows of New York. So guys, my first question, and maybe we'll start with Eric. What's your connection to the World of Darkness, and how big World of Darkness nerd are you? So I... Uh... I have a terrible confession to make. <laughs> no, uh, I've, I've loved World of Darkness since the first vampire books uh, sh showed up. Uh, I've always, I think I've role-played games since I was nine, but I'm very much a World of Darkness reader, unfortunately, than a, than a player. Uh, my my, my role-playing groups haven't really been, I think, been the, ha had the right composition for the World of Darkness games. Uh, it's, But it's by far my most loved books just to read and because they are so well written uh, and i think the uh i think the vampire uh, the masquerade the uh, version five books now are my i mean there's those beautifully produced role-playing books i own i think okay after you told us the story about your pants y yeah i can repeat it if you <laughs> want so uh, back in the 90s uh, a dog bite me and tore my my pants and I got some money from uh, from the owner of the dog to like to buy a new pair of pants. But I, when I went home, I asked my mom just to stitch them up, and I used the money to buy uh, Werewolf the Apocalypse. Smart. So, <laughs> so yes. <laughs> for a moment, we thought that maybe that's the way, like to get money for new RPGs, <laughs> but it was not sustainable. So, yeah, not a sustainable so, yeah. model. So I started like in the 90s and uh, it was Werewolf, it was Vampire when they came out in, po in Poland. And then I was, as you, Eric, I was a reader and uh, collected all the lines. Uh, and yeah, and it's like then that you went through all, all the new editions and ended up in with Vampire, the, the, the fifth edition. So, so yeah, and for... Many years of that time, I was more of a reader than a player. But when you become older, it's harder to find the people to play yeah, and time to play. Yeah, it. yeah. And we've met during your RPG times when yeah. I was an editor for World of Darkness in Sword and Sorcery magazine, and you wrote yeah. articles to it. Yeah. And Christoph, you? Uh, yeah. So I'm a bit younger than you guys. So my my story with Vod, uh, with World of Darkness starts uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, but I am uh, glad to join the mostly reading stuff club because <laughs> uh, uh, I'm, I'm a big RPG fan. I've been an RPG fan since since the late 90s, but for a long time I struggled to find a, a group that I could play together. So I used to collect a lot of RPGs and mostly not play them. Um, Vampire the Masquerade was one of those, but my introduction actually came to, to the World of Darkness and to Vampire came actually from uh, Vampire the Masquerade Redemption. Not okay. Bloodlines Redemption. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Because it was one of the games my cousin owned and he lent it to me and I've played it and I understood none of it and I suddenly started reading your section in the oh. Sword and Sorcery <laughs> magazine, which I used to skip over because I knew nothing about what it is about. Uh, I read it mostly for the more fantasy-focused stuff uh, back then. But then I kind of went through my backlog of those magazines and found, oh, okay, so that's what Anosferatu is. Okay, got it. Um, so uh, later on, I also got into. So, so when, when it came the time to to buy uh, to buy a book, I was actually uh, interested more in buying Vampire Dark Ages initially. But a lady at the store suggested I start out, out with Masquerade first, so I did that and later bought Dark Ages anyway. Uh, and yeah, and since then, I've been a big fan of uh, of the setting of World of Darkness. I think it's uh, it has excellent lore. I uh, love a lot of the stuff that Vampire the Masquerade does, and I'm happy that uh, it's now 
uh, working as a fifth edition, mm-hmm. and it's currently like being supported as well. So when is the last time you played actual tabletop RPG, maybe? Uh, How well, many years? Oh, okay, so an actual tabletop RPG with with people was uh, at the beginning of this year, but obviously, like with the whole situation going on, I actually played my last session last week, so it's oh. not that bad. Uh, my last vampire session, though, uh, was a while <laughs> ago. Yes. Yeah. So uh, my last session was, I think, uh, two months ago. It was online, uh, but it was not World of Darkness. And my last World of Darkness setting uh, session was. Uh, I oh, um, <laughs> five fish year ago probably. So it's kind yeah. of like mine, but I'm yeah. still buying yeah. all the new books and yeah, of course, yeah. of course. So so up to date, but like not not practicing. And Eric, you? Uh, I actually played yesterday. Oh, uh, oh. so you won. You won. <laughs> yeah, you won. You won. I, I'm, I'm GMing two campaigns right now. One in uh, Forbidden Lands, which is a Swedish. Ooh, oh. uh, oh, really I, like own I, uh, yeah. I own that. I own that. Haven't played uh, it yet, but and, I'm super excited. Uh, and uh, tonight I will uh, GM my uh, Call of Cthulhu campaign with another group. So. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Respect. <laughs> I mostly play one shots nowadays, but but I try to mix it up. Mm-hmm. Okay. Next question. If you have told yourself 20 years ago that you'll be doing a game which would be a canon for World of Darkness, how would you feel, Krzysztof? Uh, well, I probably wouldn't believe it uh, back then, even though it is definitely like an early, an early dream to do, to first to make an RPG-ish game, a, a story, a story-focused, narrative-focused uh, video game, and then secondly to base it on something that you're really passionate about and that you really like. Um, so even though making coteries was in some ways, uh, probably the toughest challenge of, of my entire career so far, which isn't that long, but, but still, uh, in game, in game development, I still think that like my 15 year old self would be very grateful for, for the opportunity. Arthur? Wow. <clears throat> yeah, it's not something that I, I would believe at the yeah. time. For, but, but I think this is, what what makes like uh, IPs based on RPG game on tabletop RPG game uh, unique that there's so much of of user created content. Mm. You are a player, a gamer, but you're also a content crea- creator, and sometimes that can lead to you making the official. Yeah, but, games, but still, people official... will discuss your characters, yeah. Yeah, right? Not yeah. the... and 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 this is something that that's. Uh, like I'm astonished by the by it, that that there is the path, Eric. Uh, no, actually, no. I, I I wouldn't I wouldn't have believed it at all. Uh, I actually uh, I'm I'm not sure I would have believed World of Darkness being you know being a game a, being a digital game thing. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's especially so rate, table, right? Table, so, yeah, uh, but but uh, it's uh, I mean I'm so happy. To do it, I lo- I love I love the IPs. I love the, the all the lore and all you know all the secrets and everything about it. So. Okay, so can you name your free the, 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 the free best World of Darkness systems for you and why? Absolutely, uh, I mean Wraith the Oblivion, yeah. obviously. <laughs> That's why there's yeah. free because yeah, 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 because yeah. Yeah. would have yeah. to say. <laughs> so. Uh, First of all, rate the oblivion because I just love the whole vision of the underworld, and to me that it's just so incredibly imaginative, and and it's a fun place to explore uh, in uh, uh, in in a game. And also, you know, the duality of the psyche and the shadow yeah. is just it's just such a wonderful material to work with. I also love uh, Vampire the Masquerade. I think uh, it it is, I think by far the most you know, rich in, you know, intriguing as in you <laughs> setting, you know, with, with, there's so much conflict uh, under the surface. Uh, and I'm also really, really interested in Mage, the Ascension. I'm actually, uh, I have a couple of the uh, uh, core books in, in the mail being sent to me right now that I really want to read up on those. There's something about that setting and the whole freedom of the magic system that is, feels really, really cool to me. And I'm also looking to your game because for me, like player and shadow and psyche was really hard to role play, but it will be, I think, better to experience this during the video game when this won't, uh, uh, this won't require another player who will be in sync with you and, and team play, yes. but against you, right? Which is really, really hard for me. Okay, yes. Arthur, you're free. Uh, 
I will skip the vampire because okay. I it, think obvious, it will yeah. be uh, it will be discussed. <laughs> but uh, Probably, yeah. I would say Rave conceptually. It's yeah. a great game, and at the time, the Shadow Psyche system yeah. was amazing. Was an amazing concept Very for innovative, me. Very innovative. Yeah. And when we started playing it, it yeah. totally didn't work out with the group we had at the moment. I <laughs> so it's yes. like my platonic love. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Mage, I'm a huge fan of of all Mage books, and uh, yeah, I was uh, when I was uh, at, at high school. It was like, like this way of seeing reality. Or Prime is he, is this technocracy? You know, it it was a bit cheesy, but that but the symbolism and that like the magic, but but in 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 the contemporary setting, uh, it was not so obvious at the time for me. Uh, and uh, werewolf, yes, mm. and I think that that. Uh, my relationship with werewolf changes over the years. Uh, when I started, it was like more fun and carnage. Mm. And the longer I look at the system, the more I see how re- relevant the themes, mm. uh, themes are. Especially and, in 2020. Especially in 2020. So, Environmentalism so, yeah, and all so that, So yeah. this is like, it's a bit of campish, like camp, like a kitsch, but, but very on point, on what's going on, and yeah, so so it's also the, the third, like most important system for me, I, I'd say. Mm. Well, in the first three. Yeah. <laughs> so for me, um, I, I could go the easy route and just say Vampire Times Three. So basically, <laughs> Dark, Ages. <laughs> Dark Ages, Masquerade, and Requiem. Uh, <laughs> however, to mix things th- things up, I will mention uh, Rave as well as something that I've been interested in. Uh, for years and years, but I haven't actually touched on that uh, that much until I bought the core book for from the I think the second edition from a friend a few years back. So now I own it, and I uh, now I will be able to actually dive into it and and figure out what it's all about. And I'm kind of excited about that. But the other thing is uh, like the regular World of Darkness setting with mortals, the way it was introduced in Chronicles of Darkness, mm-hmm. um, that was kind of interesting too to see. The, um, uh, to see the perspective of uh, people who aren't in, in any of the camps yet yeah. and only become slightly aware of something being off about the world and trying to investigate and then maybe being embraced into being a vampire or uh, or you know or or finding out that they're actually that they actually have some werewolf in them etc. So I'm really happy Eric that you're making uh, a game that might be able to be that gateway into into Wraith for people who are fascinated by it, but maybe, like the guy said, haven't found the right group to play it. That's uh, really cool. I think you're right that some of, of, of my like most satisfying games were the origin stories. Yeah. When we started playing as mortals and slowly were like emerged in the in the unnatural. Yeah, because that kind of mirrors your experience as a player, right? You're, mm-hmm. You don't know anything about the world, and then you, when you roleplay as a character uh, who doesn't know anything about the world yet, your journey kind of mirrors mm-hmm. the journey that your character is taking. So I think that's that's a nice way to bridge that gap. Yeah, Because I really have like World of Dark superheroes when werewolves are throwing vampires and vice versa, or just yeah. see the shadows of the something is wrong, and you investigate and see the, all the horror that lurks beneath the reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the, less the, flashy, but more kind of... The know. throwing cars part is also satisfying. Yeah, right? sure. <laughs> <laughs>
feel it? Can you hear it pounding? Scratching at the walls. Itching to be set free. It's changing you. So let's talk about your games, Arthur. What is your game about? What is why you're, why you're making this uh, and was a main oh, theme? This is an origin story, sort of. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Segway. And, uh, and it's a werewolf game, so it's uh, about uh, activism and maybe the borders, exploring the borders of activism. It's about being angry. Uh, about about rage, about seeing the world as it is and reacting emotionally to it. And we place the game in Poland, so it's also about some things that happen in, in Europe and uh, in particular in, in Białowieża. It's an ancient primordial forest, one of the last in Europe, and it's being illegally logged. So it's about the logging and about sa saving the forest. So it's, uh, we hoped it will be like a fresh look on the werewolf because usually when you think werewolf, you think like Amazon or, or, or um, pipelines, mm. so something like this. And it's, it's cool, but there are many more interesting things happening on Earth like the world of darkness, I like the world part, <laughs> and, and places where there is still almost untouched nature, when there is technology and greed, and there can be werewolves between those two opposites, like tearing heads off <laughs> or throwing cars, <laughs> so, or, or just caring very much about stuff. Maybe too much. Maybe too much, and, and that's, for, for me, that's a unique setting we can put player in, players in and let them explore how they feel about it all. So, so, so that's, the, that's how we try to approach our game. Eric, your game? So Afterlife is, uh, it's also, uh, it's very much an introduction into the world of, world, of, of Wraith the Oblivion. It's about, you know, be becoming a Wraith and you know, finding out how the world works. Uh, and uh, because the underworld is a large place and there's tons of intrigue there as well, uh, and we don't want to throw players in at the deep end. Uh, so we really want to, uh, like you said, we want to introduce the players to the world of Wraith the Oblivion. We want, we want them to, uh, you know, be intrigued by our game and maybe, you know, search out other stuff. So it takes place uh, mainly in the Shadowlands. Uh, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very much aware of the larger pieces. And for those who don't know, can you explain what Shadowlands are? So the Shadowlands are kind of like a mirror of the Skinlands of our world. It's, uh, it's, it's where wraiths and specters <laughs> dwell and uh, and fight for fight for, basically other fight for the for their souls. Uh, it's um, it's a place that is very similar to our world, but where time moves differently and and, and t uh, items and stuff from different ages can coexist. Uh, 
And it's also a very, it's, it's a place where death is obviously very much present. Uh, Afterlife is very much a horror game. Uh, it's, it's, we want to scare people a lot. Oh. <laughs> uh, it's also a VR game, so it's the first time uh, the world of darkness enters the, the world of virtual reality. Uh, so, uh, um, and it's a first-person game. It's built very much around exploration and, uh, and, and, and figuring out the story for yourself rather than having it linearly told to you. And of course, the conflict with your shadow is very much in the center. It wouldn't be a Wraith game. Otherwise, awesome. That sounds, yeah, sounds great. Sounds, that you want sounds to play great. It? Yeah. <laughs> sounds, sounds like something that I'm gonna uh, sweat really, cra- uh, really like crazy when I'm gonna play it because I'm not. I'm not as a person who's making a kind of a horror game. I'm not a big horror fan. So I mean, I, I like the, I like horror, but I don't like being scared. So there's a <laughs> and when you get older, the video games scare you more. Believe me. Okay. Well, that's not. Encouraging because I thought I was getting better uh, with time, but apparently mm-hmm. it's going to be a bell curve. Um, so, in terms of our games, um, one of them is already out, mm-hmm. Coteries of New York. Uh, and that one, uh, which released uh, last year, December last year, on PC, and uh, I believe in March of 2020 on, on all the other consoles, on the other platforms. Uh, Coteries is mostly like. Uh, it seems your you, your guys' games uh, an introduction to the world uh, to the world of darkness, specifically to Vampire: The Masquerade. It's a very kind of um, newbie friendly experience, uh, and so the story is about uh, as uh, about about as familiar for a Vampire: The Masquerade game as it can get. It's, you're basically a fish out of water, a new newly fledged vampire, um, and you are dropped into an intrigue uh, citywide uh, a citywide intrigue in New York City. Um, that you kind of have to find your way, uh, have to find your way in. Uh, the upcoming game, Shadows of New York, is a more personal uh, game. That's uh, the conflict there is much more um, centered around um, a single playable character who I'm hoping to be able to, to say something more uh, with the uh, as, as we progress. But basically. Um, what Arthur said about like being current and being very like 2020 and talking about current year issues, uh, that's also something that we try to do. Uh, and specifically, Shadows is about isolation. It's about feeling alone. It's about feeling. Uh, it's about feeling uh, unimportant. And um, basically, if you're willing to do some questionable things to perhaps get out of there and empower yourself or if you think that it's the better it's if if it's better that than to just you know uh stay low and accept that you might not be uh the hero of your own story in a way i see the start of how to hunt in lockdown yeah <laughs> yeah 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 uh, that there we we do since we did set it in uh the current time and we did start writing it around February, March, uh, the lockdown and especially like the, the, um, uh, what happened in, in New York City at the time is a bit, it, it's, it, it is an element of the, of the world building, definitely. Like, we didn't shy away from that. So can you tell us a bit more about the character and why did you chose him or her? Right. So for Coleries, like I mentioned, we had a fish out of water character, a newly fledged vampire. We had three of those to choose from, uh, Free clans, Bruja, Toriador, and Ventru. Uh, and those characters were sketched a little bit, but they were mostly left to the player's imagination as to what do you think those characters would do in this situation, right? So we had like a short intro sequence in which you got a basic their basic background, but you were free to um, free to play them as as you thought they would um, they would uh, you know behave in a certain situation. In Shadows of New York, uh, we've got our protagonist, Julia, who I'm, I'm kind of, when I learned about Maya from your game, I kind of, uh, uh, I kind of laughed that the girls could, could shake their hands if uh, Maya wouldn't, if Maya's first instinct wouldn't be to rip Julia's head off. Um, but uh, Julia is also um, an immigrant. Uh, um, she's, uh, she's of Polish descent. She's, uh, she uh, hails from, uh, she, she was brought up in Chicago, then moved to New York City. Uh, and she's basically um, 
in life, she was kind of a person uh, who mostly lives on the internet. She had friends, but not many of them, and not many of them were close. She was kind of isol- she was kind of isolated in life uh, because of her character. And then when she is embraced into the La Sombra clan, suddenly even that uh, connection with the world, even the internet and the, the, di- the digital, the digital ways of interconnecting pe- with people is gone for her. So she uh, becomes this um, sort of a recluse with a few uh, contacts, both within the city's kindred population as well as uh, a few mortals here and there. Uh, that she still keeps contact with, but she basically spends a lot of her time uh, just in a, in a diner, in a like in a, in a lousy, in a lousy fast food restaurant, uh, not doing anything in particular really, and having a sort of an official position, but one that doesn't really mean anything in the larger scheme of things. So she's in this uh, in this weird situation where she's kind of in limbo and doesn't really know. Um, how long she's going to stay there. But then she gets an opportunity to do something about it. Then the it. game starts. And yeah, <laughs> and, and she, gets, she gets the opportunity to do something about it because there's a big event, which we, uh, which we also mention in, in the game's description. Um, that's a political event, but it will involve her personally. And depending on how she handles that sh- situation, she might come out on top or not really. So Tomara came up, so I think it's your turn now. Yeah, so... Our, uh, our main character is, uh, she's called Maya and she's <coughs> a Polish-American. So uh, she was born in America, but, but from Polish parents. And she comes to Poland because she suspects that there is, well, she comes here to study, but, but she suspects that there is some dark secret in her family's past. Spoiler, there is. <laughs> and and it has look at the title of the game. It has something she, to do with werewolves. And, but she, and she explores the world. And so she's also uh, sort of like a gateway character because uh, her story introduces you, introduces you to the world of darkness. But also she's like an introduction for non-Polish players to Poland, to the, to, to Poland and to the, to the situation. And at the same time, she has very real reasons to be there. So it's not, not like, like a deus ex machina thing. And uh, what kind of character she is, it's in fact a part of the gameplay. So she has a background, but by your choices, by, by how you play, you shape her personality and... You decide who she really is, is as a person, and well, I think it works really okay. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon. Who will die in your game? So uh, our game begins uh, when Ed Miller dies <laughs> <laughs> and uh, becomes a wraith. Ed Miller is a photographic artist in Los Angeles uh, who is a he's poor. He's been trying to sell his art uh, for years and years, uh, but it doesn't work out. And uh, he uh, he gets he he wants to leave LA and start over somewhere with his wife Rachel. Uh, uh, but but they're broke, and he gets a final um, he gets a job from from his uh, the ga- the gallery owner where he sells his art, uh, and that is to. Uh, document a, a thing at the Barclay Mansion, which is, uh, which is where the game takes place. Uh, and Ed is someone, he's, a, he's an, I guess you could say, unhappily married man. Uh, the Barclay Mansion is owned by, uh, by a movie mogul. Uh, it's, it, this story very much takes place in the movie business and, you know, with movie stars and, t- and, and TV show um, presenters and stuff like that uh so so it's really a story about the decadence and what's you know what's hidden behind all the all the glamour uh oh, death <laughs> is hidden behind the glamour obviously uh and uh so it's i, I guess you could say it's a, it's a story about both figuring out the barclay mansion's past but also figuring out who ed miller is um we don't have any multiple, you know, you, you can't choose. It's about figuring out who he is in, in conjunction with, with his shadow, of course.
you hear it pounding, scratching at the walls, itching to be set free. It's changing you. Okay, so you all said that you have introduction and origin story of your yeah. characters, but will like hardcore players will find something for them, or World of Darkness fans will find something interesting in your games, or is it just for newcomers, new people to the genre? Well, I, I think we get it easy because werewolf fans are really like waiting for a werewolf like, like game. Like unloved children, right? Yeah, <laughs> waiting for so, presents, yeah. and we have the werewolf game, <laughs> so. It is an origin story, so it's very new user-friendly, like new player-friendly, but I think that uh, it will be also interesting for, interested for, interesting for, for, for the seasoned, seasoned players. Uh, but can I it think, be hard, like hard to finish, or will, be, will well, there be any challenge in your game? Uh, well, the challenge is, first of all, if you will be, you, you can be dissatisfied with the person Maya becomes, so it is part of a challenge. Uh, you can make some decisions when you're raging that you will later regret, so that's hard. Can but, I die in your game? Uh, you know, stories about werewolves have certain tra- to tra- 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 tragedy. Uh, tra- tragedy? Tragedy. tragedy? So stories about werewolves have like a dose of tragedy built in. So they are about, you know, a race of doomed warriors. So I think there is a possibility that like a Greek it, tragedy, it, will right? not, mm. it will not end well. But uh, I can assure that even if you were if you will be playing a story with a, like tragic outcomes. Uh, you will get a chance to see the whole story. So we made it that way. There are no dead ends. You play the whole story and you have some time to live with the consequences of, your, of what you've done or, or not, depending on, on your choices. So, so yeah. Okay, Eric, and in, in your game, apart from being scared to death in VR and joining so, the race? Uh, so our game is... Um, uh, it's, it's a game... It's it's at its heart mechanically it's a stealth game. It's a game about hiding from <laughs> from a lot of the dangers, uh, and a consequence of being found <laughs> by the specters uh, roaming this this uh, this mansion is it's it's a very immediate danger. Okay, <laughs> you could say. Uh, so yes, you can definitely die you are already dead uh but uh but it's also we we are also uh looking at ways um uh, to let to let players who aren't necessarily super hardcore or <laughs> into that uh to to give them um they might be more interested in in just the narrative and stuff so we're looking into ways uh, to accommodate them as well and make make the game as fun Christoph? So, um, as, as for the part of the question uh, for like whether um, veterans will find something in the games, uh, Coteries and Shadows both are games that are mostly intended for people new to the world of darkness, but obviously we are building from existing lore, from um, source books like uh, New York by Night and updating them to Vampire V5, to the 5th edition. 
So uh, the end result of that is that for veterans, uh, it's a chance to see some uh, well-known characters and seeing what they're what they were up to uh, over the last 20 years, uh, and figuring out where does that leave New York City as such. But we've accommodated new players by adding stuff like uh, dictionary functionality, for example. So anytime. A uh, new term comes up that you're not familiar with, it's probably going to end up in your dictionary and you can look it up at whatever time you, you wish. Um, and uh, in Coteries, that dictionary is like very encyclopedic. We literally took stuff from the lexicon, from the V5 core book. So uh, people familiar with those terms will, will see them reflected in, uh, in, in that dictionary. But for Shadows of New York, since that's a very personal story, we decided to have those terms explained to the player by Julia. So it's more like her diary and kind of her notes on the topic. So it's sometimes not entirely accurate or a little bit like skewed from one perspective uh, from from one perspective to another. But Julia was a journalist in life, so she kind of can, she has a good eye for detail and uh, therefore the things that, that you can find there are pretty factual, even if a bit colored. As for the Dying question. Yeah. Uh, I could dodge that by saying, you She's know, we're already, already dead because yeah, yeah. obviously <laughs> they're vampires. But final death is still but a thing. final death is still a thing. And while you uh, while you can die in uh, Coteries of New York, um, and there's a whole uh, basically if you act too brashly and you allow the beast to take over, um, the beast is this kind of. Um, this need for the vampire to feed, and it's like a very primal thing. It's not. It's not something that you can reason with uh, if you do not feed, and if 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 you t- let hunger overtake you. Um, we actually do have a game over there. Uh, you can also die at a different scene uh, way before that. Uh, if you kind of try, if you try rejecting your new found fate, and it's kind of similar uh, in the second. Point. It's similar to Shadows, which also has kind of like um, early ending if you want to see uh, what happens if you basically just decide to not continue the story. But uh, generally speaking, we wanted uh, the player to see the whole of Julia's story. So we, so Shadows is a little bit uh, more mechanics light than Coteries was. It's more of a streamlined uh, sh- Closer to that visual novel model that we kind of rom- uh, that we kind of you know uh, tried to accommodate for in Coteries, but didn't quite get there in Shadows. We kind of decided, okay, yeah, well, we're, if we're doing a visual novel, let's do it like in keeping with uh, how the genre is usually treated. So, I think yeah. I, I, sh- I should also mention that uh, I mean, uh, the, the, our game is set in the Shadowlands, and yes, it's it's we, we see it as an introduction into the race uh, underworld. But the rest of the underworld is very much present there, uh, and we try to stay very, very true to all the lore. Uh, that well, that is one of the you know we're, we're fairly rule slight. It's not a role playing game, uh, but we try to stay as true as we can uh, to to the lore of the game or to, to to all the books. Okay, so I think this is be one of the most interesting questions. If I'm a fan of a world of darkness, how do I make a video game set? in this world, because I think other people who are watching us would love to be in your position, right? So, who would like to tell uh, uh, how, how, how to start to do it? What do I need? Well, I think there are no easy answers. Yeah, we yeah, have a lot in, of time. In our, in our case, we've been like working in the video games industry for years and years, and then an occasion arose, and we... And so, as we were... So, let me rephrase yeah. the question. What do I need to prepare to approach the IP owner, which is a product, and that, and start talking to them about making another World of Darkness video game? I think it's really important as a, as an independent developer to prepare a lot for rejection. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? It's a part of life. Because mo- most most of the time you will get rejected, because, and, and that might be you not know, because the time is not right or your idea is not. You know, I think you, you've got a point. You, you need to love. The IP, you need to love the world, but you also need to bring something new. And Eric, with you, I have most difficult question be, uh, task because we all seen vampires and werewolves in movies, but Shadowlands, nobody ever did Shadowlands visually, and even in the books, you don't have many pictures of how no. does that look. Yeah. So, no, no. how do you design a world that nobody has seen ever? 
that's quite a challenge, right? <laughs> uh, vis- visually, it's uh, it's one of our. I mean, it's it's one of our largest challenges. One of our, one of the biggest challenges is to actually design something that nobody has seen yeah. yet. <laughs> we can lean we can lean on the lore. We can lean on the history of, of every. And, and we are you know the brands team is is extremely helpful there. there I, I, there's no question they can't answer. They know everything <laughs> it's, it's almost <laughs> scary <laughs> it is scary actually but but anyway they know everything uh but when it comes to how to visually design the shadowlands we have a lot of freedom i mean they have opinions of course and we ask we we, we bounce ideas back and forth uh with paradox uh a lot uh but I feel they are extremely nice to work with and and very open to new ideas. And uh, I mean, in our case, nobody has seen the Shadowlands. So I mean, um, what what we do is is bound to make a mark. <laughs> and I'm I really want that mark to be a positive one and you know something that you know people people can look back on. It's going to evolve. It's going to everything is going to evolve over the years, and World of Darkness is such a big place. Uh, but it's really cool to see, you know, when we say that the Barclay Mansion exists, you know, somewhere in, in Los Angeles, then that's it. It's there. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and that, to me, is just so exciting. It's, it's like you, we're building a big universe uh, together. And, uh, and, uh, but yeah, they're, they're really good uh, to, to bounce ideas with. Okay, so World of Darkness is a psychological deep, deep game. How do you ensure you have this feeling in the video games, which sometimes are not that thoughtful, deep, and engaging? Mm. Yeah, so it's it has to do, I think, with um, at least in in our in our case, because with uh, Eric and uh, Fast Travel, that might be a little bit different, since the, the game is. Uh, Less of an RPG and more of an like an immersive immersive experience, but I think that um, a key thing is to realize that uh, you're not making a game that is about winning. Uh, you can definitely a player can feel like they're doing well or they can feel like they're not doing very well, but it's not about Uh, the end effect and a score at it's the end. It's a journey that matters. Yeah, well, it's the, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a journey and the destination kind of guy. So I also like to uh, like to do uh, uh, li- like to see like um, endings endings to things also being satisfying. But uh, but for a game that's mostly about in our case mostly about sitting down and reading, it needs to be immersive and it needs to feel like there is something worthwhile in the fact that you're now spending this time in kind of this headspace uh, instead of blasting away at, at aliens or doing whatever else. I also like blasting away at, at aliens, not to like, you know, poke poke at any other genre of game. But I do like when there is enough meat on those storytelling bones that I can actually, like, I, I really like it even when, if it's a action-oriented game when I understand why am I doing the thing, right? Like the action of doing the thing can be nice, it can have nice feedback and it can be a very well-animated thing and has great soundtrack, etc. But if it doesn't mean anything at the end of the day, I, me personally, I kind of lose interest pretty quickly, which is why I prefer single-player games to multiplayer games. For, because for me, every like multiplayer match is kind of a... And it's it's kind of thing that starts, it ends, and I'm not sure if I've gathered anything... In the meantime, that kind of will stick with me, right? Whereas if I play a video game that's very narrative focused and it tells me a story and it asks me to make decisions and I kind of have to see what those decisions mean for the character in the long term, I feel like I might have seen at least like an interesting perspective on something that I didn't consider before, if nothing else. And that I, that I think is very worthwhile. Absolutely. As you said, we have it easy yeah. <laughs> because <coughs> we have a game that's text-based and in our case it's written as it were told by the main character. So it's I was, I did. And uh, so she's telling her own story. Uh, and we are asking the, the players to decide on the character's emotions. Like... 
I was so angry or I stayed out of it. And in a text game, two funny things can happen. First, when you see the option, you automatically understand that these are the thoughts the character has at the moment. At the moment. And even if, if you... Uh, if I uh, choose one of the options, I know that the character was thinking about those things. And, and uh, it, it builds like this psychological like connection with the character. And the stuff we also do, because we are uh, putting a huge focus on rage, is that uh, as you, your rage changes, like the description of some scenes yep. change. So, so when you are raging, you see the world differently and the scenes are slightly different. And it also, it, it's like a feedback to your decisions. Uh, I'm angry, I, I, I make a like, decision that, that fuels my rage, the world changes, and probably I'm, it's easier for me to make another decision that's like fueling my rage. Or, 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 yeah, yeah. So, so, so that's how we approach this psychological thing. Apart from making, like, writing a good story or or, or <laughs> making you think Ma about things. things. Yeah. Yeah. And Eric, with you. So um, we have a we have a fairly large cast of characters in the game, and and what I've really focused on is trying to make these characters balanced and believable. Uh, you, you might not see a lot of them all, but but I've really tried to make them, you know, human. <laughs> because because to me, being a wraith is well, have, having been human, it's it's about it's 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 about finding or you know or keeping part of your humanity, you know, and, and not losing it. And I think in 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 any game, in any story, but definitely in games. The characters you meet, the conversations you hear, the player is always going to reflect themselves, you know, on those. Uh, so I think that's that's one thing, and 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 also being able to tell a a mature story uh, with psychological depth. I think making a wraith game, uh, and I'm not going to. I mean, our, our previous games have been, you know, they've been quite funny, or, or you know, placed in these fantastical science fiction locations. That's awesome. I love love writing and building stuff like that as well. But at least in the, our previous games haven't, you know, really delved into psychological depth. <laughs> Whereas a wraith game really gives us that, you know, opportunity to dig down into something, and you know, what, how would people act if, you know in certain situations and, you know, and, and just seeing the repercussions of what people did, because you are dead, you're going to see stuff that you, you know, that happened before, etc. cetera. And, uh, and I think there's a lot of stuff for us to explore there. Uh, and, uh, for, for me, it's mainly about making sure that the characters are believable as I spent a lot of time making sure that they are. I feel they are anyway. <laughs> so before we move to the questions from Twitter, which we gathered in the last two days, uh, the last question from me is how should I prepare for your game? What to read? What to watch? Of, of course, apart from core books of RPG system, but should I like see, read or watch something that will help me um, to be more in line with your game? What would you suggest I do? So I don't think you have to read any. Yeah, but if you would like to to prepare myself for a race yeah. experience. But, but I, I think you should. <laughs> I think you should read uh, the Wraith, Wraith the Oblivion core book, at least, you know, uh, because it's... And, and hopefully that, you know, feeds your f imagination yeah. and you want to read more, you want to explore more. And I think for, for a Wraith fan, there's going to be stuff in our game, you know, where they say, I recognize this. I know what this is. And I think that that is probably going to you know that that is going to add something to your experience uh and 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 also i think uh and it, it is a vr title so so if there's something you can do <laughs> to prepare <laughs> is if you don't have a vr headset, get a VR headset. <laughs> that's one yeah yeah it's okay. uh 
V- VR is super exciting to me, and that, that's all, that makes this game even more exciting. So can you tell us on which VR systems it will work, the game, the game will work? Or is it too early? So we're basically releasing this on, on, on all the systems. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. going to be available on, on Oculus Quest, on Rift, on, the, on all the PC, you know, on, on the Valve Index, uh, on the PlayStation VR uh, system, awesome. etc. So, so we're a multi-platform studio, so we release it to as many platforms as we possibly can. Awesome. Arthur, so how should I prepare for Biało Wieża? You don't really have to prepare, uh, but if you're interested, because uh, what's uh, sort of unique for, for this game that we are uh, talking about, uh, or we are being inspired by real events. So if you're interested, if you want some, some uh, in-depth preparation, you can read about the events, about the, the protests around the logging, Uh, and see how they happen, the what happens in the real world, and then compare your experiences. But you can also just buy the game, play the game, and then probably uh, be interested at, and read about Biało Wieża and, 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 and everything what happens there. Mm. And Christoph, with your game? Yeah, so for Shadows of New York, the obvious question would be uh, buy and play Coteries uh, of New York, which is which Shadows is... Uh, Standalone expansion. Uh, it's a standalone game, but it's we kind of think of it as a companion piece. It shows a different perspective on the city, and uh, it continues some of the uh, some of the plot threads um, that have been started by Coteries. But for the most part, um, again, both games are kind of newbie friendly. So even if you don't know anything about Vampire: The Masquerade, you can jump in. I would probably suggest jumping into Coteries more so than Shadows if you're, to- if you're totally new to it because it does a little bit, it kind of eases you into, because those, 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 descript- those uh, definitions that I've mentioned are more en- uh, encyclopedic than personal. It's kind of more of a, okay, this is, this is this concept and this is what it is, rather than this is what the main character thinks this is. So as an introductory game, Coteries is probably a little bit better. But if you want an introduction into um, Shadows of New York, or generally speaking, vampires and New York, a big inspiration for um, for Shadows of New York uh, for our writer was the movie The Addiction from the 90s. Uh, and it's this, it's this classy black and white vampire flick that basically uses vampirism as a, as a metaphor, but it nails the feeling of, uh, of the city. Uh, back in the 90s. So in that way, it's a really interesting uh, look into uh, what, a, um, what a big met- big US metropolis could be if vampires lived in it.
Can you hear it pounding? Scratching at the walls. Itching to be set free. It's changing you. Okay, so Twitter time questions. The first one, guys, which project are you looking forward to the most, excluding your own, Krzysztof? Mm. I, I think it's a World of Darkness project, of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I've played the demo to Heart of the Forest, and I really, really liked it. So uh, even though I'm not a huge werewolf fan, that kind of put, put the game on my radar, and I'm, I'll be happy to try it out when it, when it releases. Uh, so... Mm, everything that uh, everything that I've basically re- learned from Eric about Afterlife sounds super interesting. So that's he will made us buy VR headsets. Yeah. So whenever I get the uh, whenever like I a get a VR, drug. Yeah, kind of. Whenever I get a VR headset, I'll definitely have a look at Afterlife because all that all that stuff sounds super interesting. And I also uh, demoed. Uh, I've also played the demo of Heart of the Forest. And I really like that. So even though I'm not a huge fan of Werewolf, uh, that definitely put the game on my radar. But what I'm uh, the the one thing that uh, the one game that's not being discussed here that I'm looking forward to is Swan Song. Uh, Vampire, Vampire Masquerade, Masquerade yeah, Swan Song. Yeah, because that, that it looks really really cool. The trailer. We is, love the trailer. Yeah, the, the trailer seemed very uh, very interesting. Arthur. Yeah. Well, right now because I hype very easily, I'm very <laughs> hyped uh, for the Oblivion uh, for the World Afterlife. of Oblivion Afterlife because. Uh, I imagined like VR headsets, the specters and stuff like this. Swan Song yeah. is great. I will definitely play uh, Shadows of the New York. And uh, I'm also curious about the big werewolf yeah, game. Big Brother, our big brothers. Yeah. I, I'm, a, like, I'm a lame gamer, so I will probably get my ass handed to me many times. <laughs> so, so. I'm not sure if excited is the right word, but yeah. intrigued. intrigued yeah. <laughs> I'm curious about it. Eric, how about you? So uh, I uh, actually, uh, I think I got the key for uh, Heart of the Forest yeah. uh, for, uh, from Andreas at, at Fast Travel Games. So I actually, uh, I'm looking, really looking forward to playing that. I know I've got Coteries of New York installed, so I'm really looking forward to playing that. <laughs> Whenever uh, you find Shadows time, of man. New York, of course. The thing is that, that I, I have so little time to play actually yeah. <laughs> games these days. So you know, you keep building this pile of stuff. But but uh, the all the all these games sound super interesting, uh, and uh, I'm really looking forward to playing that. Uh, I'm also, of course, super interested in seeing what's going to happen with Bloodlines too. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I, I loved Vampire the Blood, Vampire the Mag- Masquerade, Bloodlines in all its buggy glory back in the day. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I uh, am really looking forward to seeing what, what what's happening there. I actually haven't seen the trailer to Swan Song, so I immediately need to. So go you need do to that you need to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Finish here. Okay, Werewolf Team, how does it feel to bring this world to life through your work? Well, it feels great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but aren't you afraid somebody will say that's not well, how I yes, imagine this world? Of course, I'm terrified. We, we've just at the moment of recording, we've just released the demo to the wider public. Yeah. It's the end uh, of the August for us, and uh, the reactions are really nice. 
and I'm terrified because I know that the whole game have to like live up to the expectations. <laughs> so the feelings are mixed. I remember this one Fine preview where mixed. in the flaws of a demo set, the full game might, might not be as good as the demo. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Vampire Team. How does the experience gained from Coteries influence Shadows? So, um, basically, um, Shadows is built using much of the same framework that we used for Coteries. So, definitely, like, on the technical side of things, even though we haven't quite uh, managed to avoid um, any uh, any problems, we definitely had less of them than we had during making Coteries. So, uh, techni- to- so you know, technology-wise, we're preset. Uh, that's definitely an influence that basically takes a lot of my mind whenever I uh, implement the game. Uh, and we also, uh, since since Coteries was our first dip as a studio into a narrative-heavy game, we also learned from the, from uh, people's response to the game what worked for it and what didn't. We kind of uh, figured, uh, we, we took all of that into account when creating Shadows and deciding what to focus on. So uh, in that way, I believe Shadows is going to be uh, in some ways, uh, a bit of a stronger and tighter experience than Coteries was. So, Coteries was definitely a learning experience for us. Rave team, what is the most challenging thing about making a VR game? Um, getting player presence right, making sure that the player is <laughs> in the world, not you know watching it. Uh, I think that's the single most difficult thing ever. Um, when you uh, touch things and lift things in the real world, they're tactile, you can feel it, they have weight, etc. When you touch and move things in, uh, whether it's you know, using Wraith Grasp or a, you know, a, some kind of Arcanoi, uh, or just physically touching things, in VR they don't have weight, we need to simulate it somehow, you need to, you know, fingers should act in a way that is believable to you as a player, instead of pulling you out of the experience, it should immerse you more, etc. Uh, that is, and I think will always be the most difficult thing about making VR games. Another thing is is VR storytelling, because we can never, ever take control away from the player. That's just, we can't do that. We can't force them to watch something. We can't, you know, you have 360 degrees. <laughs> it can just choose to go away <laughs> or, you know, take a step outside, etc. So that, that's, that is also very challenging and fun. It's a fun, both are fun challenges. Okay, so what's the release date? It's another question. If you can, yeah, of course, uh, so what you're allowed to say. Er, early 2021 for now. Okay. And, uh, so it's like Q1, right? right? Yes, yeah. Arthur? Well, we hope for Q4 this year. And not December, right? Well, not <laughs> December. Probably not December. Yeah. But who knows? But who knows, who knows? yeah. Uh, at the time of recording, we're set to release uh, sometime in uh, September. So there is a slight chance uh, the game is already going to be um, already going to be available when you see this. But awesome. Let's hope so. What are you really afraid of, Krzysztof? Uh, so, shall we go for the serious answer or shall we go for the funny answer? Maybe both. Both? Uh, well, the world is kind of scary now, isn't it? Uh, and, I think, <laughs> and I think that's kind of... Uh, you, you, if you play Heart of the Forest and if you play Shadows and probably um, probably Afterlife will still yeah, You'll have... be scared from the raves in Afterlife and VR, come on. Yeah, we yeah all but know what I'm saying is uh, it's it's kind of hard to dissociate yourself uh, as as an artist, quote-unquote, making video games when you uh, when you are here now and living through the times that we're living through. So some of that stuff will probably have an echo in, in our work, right? Uh, and there is this uh, kind of... Uh, uh, the fear of what's going to happen to the environment, the fear of what's uh, the fear of uh, what's going to happen to you as a person, as the world kind of um, transfers from you know one social system to another. Uh, so the, the, the themes of like feeling alone and feeling oppressed uh, that we um, that we tap into in, in shadows, for example. So that kind of stuff. Uh, I am generally, uh, I might have mentioned this before, I am kind of scared of uh, horror games in general. So, so after I don't, life. So I don't, have, I don't have a very good stomach for that. Actually, uh, quick, quick, quick aside here, uh, that haunted motel level from Bloodlines that everybody knows, 
The first time I was able to actually finish it from start to finish, what I had to do is I had to basically turn on the sound <laughs> and play some upbeat rock music on Have you my, played Condemned? On my play. I did, I did. I did go through Condemned and that one didn't do that much for me, oh. but I also played it much later on. So I, was, I, I used to be very queasy about horror. I'm still, I still am, but I can kind of cope. So, Arthur, apart from failing the expectations that was put on you after reading the demo, well, <laughs> we are working on a game that's very, like, uh, nature-centric. So, it's hard not to feel this climate anxiety, mm -hmm. climate change anxiety, maybe some political issues yeah. also. Um, yeah, and what you said, this will be the funny part. <laughs> Years ago, when I was playing The Thief, mm -hmm. the, I, the Haunted Orphanage, I didn't manage to finish it because I was so stressed that, I, that I'm in someone's apartment oh, no, and they can it. just like find me there <laughs> and I would be so like embarrassed. <laughs> so I, 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 I loved the game and I've never finished it because of like the anxiety that I'm So just... it wasn't the Haunted Orphanage, which is <laughs> no. another like very, very uh, I didn't even iconic, iconic, scary level from a video game. Okay, Eric, what are you afraid of? So... I mean, it's it's obvious the times we live in are scary times. Uh, I think um, a lot of what scares me is what people do to each other. Uh, I think when making games, though, I I try to always think of at least the games that we build at Fast Travel Games and that I've you know worked on previously. I try to remember that these are actually they're actually products. That, that are there to entertain as well, right? Uh, so even we, we uh, there are some, you know, some stuff I wouldn't, I, I just would never write about it. I, I wouldn't, you know, put the stuff that scares me the most in a story that is there to entertain. Uh, but it's about finding the balance because we also want to, you know, like you said, environmental horror, etc. I mean, it's, we can't shy away from those things either. Uh, so it's about finding a balance, I feel. Yeah, between escapism and like saying something that's actually worthwhile and might, you know, actually make people think about an issue. Uh, that that's a tough balance to to strike. But you so know, the next question, trying. Christopher, is for you. It's about hope introductionary, which was for the uh, people, uh, for the person who has the far the best introduction of the character. Will yep. we see similar? Think in the shadows. Okay, so um, and for me, hope also was the best character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well hope, uh, hope was definitely like the hope and Angelo. I think are the two companions who are most fondly, uh, most fondly remembered from Coteries. And uh, in shadows, you will be able to see uh, the continuation. Th those characters will make an appearance. Uh, all four of those uh, companion potential companion characters from Coteries will make an appearance in shadows. And for those who liked. Maybe not the like the details of Hope's uh, of Hope's story, but the style in which it was created. I'm, I can say that uh, whereas uh, Coteries was written, uh, well, not primarily, but I, I was one of the writers there, and so was uh, Cross Alexander Borshovsky, who's uh, uh, who's um, Hope was his character, and it was his uh, his quest line. He is now uh, responsible for the majority of the writing for. Shadows and the character of Julia and her and the whole story surrounding her, etc. So, if you like the style of that, you, I will think love shadows. I think you should you should definitely give Shadows uh, give Shadows a try because it uh, it has a lot of his specific interests in there, which also uh, were echoed in Hope's quest. Can I be in the game? Not me, but somebody else. So, can and somebody be in the game and how to do it, Eric? I'm not 100% sure I understand the question, but... The the one, of the, one, one of the... One, yeah. Someone asked how can, can he yeah. be in the game as a character, NPC, picture, description, and how oh. can he do it? Because I know what you wanted to say. You wanted to say that basically you're playing a VR game, so you kind of are in the game already. <laughs> that was yeah. the cheap way of doing it, right? That's the cheap answer. It's, <laughs> but, I wouldn't uh, say it's cheap. So Where it's is smart. the lie? That, that's the truth. Yeah. Can you be in the game? I'd say uh, it's a very interesting proposition. It's not something we've planned, uh, but let me go back to the team and see if we can figure something out. Okay. So for me, like you need to know the team for for starters. Yeah. yeah. Arthur. Uh, 
Well, not really. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> taking taking into into account like the uh, how much time of production time we have left and stuff like this. But you shape the main character, so so like your personality reflects in how the game plays out. Krzysztof told us he is in the game, so yeah. Well, I am, but because <laughs> I'm you know I'm I'm one of the designers and writers, so I kind of smuggle myself in there. Just for a single line. So, so, so the best way to be in the game, make the damn game. Yes, that's that's a that's a surefire way to to at least be have a shot at it. But uh, otherwise, yeah, I, I would like to echo what uh, what both of you guys said that in some ways our games exist there to be uh, to allow the player to express themselves in some way. So in a way, when you play Cotteries, at least because with Julia's story, that's more personal and that's more of a that's more of a given character who you who you kind of follow through her story, but for Cotteries um, and for my and for you know uh, shaping Maya's character and for uh, being in the world of um, of afterlife, uh, you could argue that playing the game will make you be in the game in a way. And, and my advice, if you want to be in the game, you need to be really really early in the production to. To yeah. even be able to do it, so yeah. not not once it's released, and especially if you want something more than just a than just a, like an Easter egg, like yeah. a list of list of names on on a, in a book or something. So I think we kind of answered the, the the next question: Where do you see the future of this world going? But there's another question: Are we getting a new birth of World of Darkness games? And I also think that V5 is this new birth. We didn't see the werewolf. And, yet, and, anyway. and no race v5, but uh, and I think you cannot 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 talk about it right now. So I think we we'll skip to another one. Well, I I would like to say that okay. that uh, with so many World of Darkness games that are happening right now, yeah. uh, I like how the world expands. Yeah, different teams mean different places of the world, different worldviews, different and, approaches to the game, and, and I love this. Yeah, something that that something that seems to be. Uh, at the forefront of of the current world of darkness is the fact that uh, they kind of want to focus on smaller places and like less less familiar, uh, perhaps less uh, familiar places for most players. So less of the big cities. Well, like we did New York, true, but you guys, for example, are doing Via Vieja, which I think is very awesome. Uh, and uh, if you read the Anarch source book, for example. They've got all sorts of like borderline weird places to set a vampire story in, for, from my, from my perspective, from what I would expect from a vampire story. But I think that's great because it allows different creative voices to uh, add something to this uh, to the setting, and I think that's very valuable. So the question is, um, in regards to Wraith, how are you adapting Arcanoi to a video game format? But maybe we'll do it like, how do you implement your special abilities of your disciplines, Arcanoi, mm -hmm. and world stuff into the game? Okay, Christoph. So for disciplines, uh, for Coteries of New York, one of the reasons why we picked, uh, why, we, why we decided in the end to only have like three playable clans and that those were the specific clans, uh, the reason was that they share a lot of disciplines together. So we knew we only had so much time to create, vari to create um, you know, variable choices. Uh, and so we kind of settle on uh, Bruja, Toriador, and, uh, and Ventru because they all share presence and then they have one or two things that are kind of, um, that are kind of specific to them, like potents for, uh, for Bruja, uh, Dominate for Ventru, etc. So basically, since the game is text-based, it, uh, it all comes down to two things. Uh, to, the f uh, to the Masquerade, obviously. So whether using this power right now will endanger the Masquerade or not and any other consequences to using that power that might happen. So sometimes it will only cost you uh, rising, uh, rising hunger to use that, and that's all that happens because you kind of stack the situation in your favor in such a way that the mortal can do nothing to oppress you, to, to, to oppose you, and that's kind of the vampiric uh, fantasy of being you know, a powerful being that can, that can use their powers to influence people. But other times there will be sometimes surprising consequences to uh, to doing that the same way as if we were playing an RPG session and I would use my power and then roll a botch or something you would or roll a basically a yes but kind of result you'd get what you want but you also have to pay a price for shadows of new york we are tackling 
uh, De La Sombra, whose signature thing is Oblivion. Um, the power to kind of uh, th- this kind of ties to uh, right. ties to rave because it's the it's the power to interact and draw power from the other world, the other side. Uh, so what happens with uh, Julia is that she's a pretty young um, La Sombra. She's kind of learning the ropes, and for her that journey, uh, learning to use Oblivion, is mostly going to be how she sees the world around her change and how she re- realizes that she has this connection more so than, you know, using like, uh, using like shadowy tentacles to ruin the city or whatever, which is, I think, also something that's not actually as like flashy and powerful anymore in V5 than, than what we could remember from previous V2 editions. V2 and V20. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> we have an origin story, so... Uh, and we don't want to overwhelm the player with like with all the trivia that, mm-hmm. as you said, are awesome, but there's so much of them. So uh, we focus maybe on, on showing some parts of, of the Garou, of the world of society. We let the player to play with the shape-shifting with with changing from a wolf to to human to the war form and uh, this is very connected to rage and we have some glimpses of the of the umbra of the of the shadow world uh, the the spirit world the spirit uh, yeah. or some interact maybe some interactions with the spirits of nature uh, but it's uh, but but the the game takes place over like a few days, maybe a week. So for the character herself, it's not very much time to gain proficiency in all those yeah. skills. So we are just, just showing the tip of the iceberg. Okay, guys. And the last open question is, is like, please answer like your character from, from your game would do. Where are my car keys? Eric. So uh, Ed's car keys... They're left in the skin lands. Oh, so well, and it's a lot of trouble to bring them back, right? The yeah. Lands, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So where are Maya's car keys? Well, Maya probably when she changed to to Krinos, she probably just tore her clothes and lose or lost all <laughs> her, you know, belongings. So somewhere in the maybe woods, right? probably somewhere in the pushcha, so you yeah. know, in the forest. And Julia's. Um, if I recall correctly, and Cross will probably correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Julia doesn't actually drive a car, I don't think. Dakota does, her, her <laughs> touchstone and her like close mortal, close mortal fl- friend. And so, yeah, Dakota's keys are probably in her apartment, where Julia also sometimes resides. Julia doesn't drive since, you know, have, being La Sombra and having an automatic... Uh, um, what's the word? Automatic um, transmission. Transmission. Yeah, having an automatic transmission is kind of a pain in the butt. So. <laughs> okay, guys, thanks a lot. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I do. And yeah. I am looking really forward to play all of our games. Yeah, it was hey. great talking to you. Yeah, this great was having, this was great. This was fun. Yeah. Great yeah. having you on. Eric, thank as you. Well. Bye. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you, everyone. Bye. Bye.